Good evening. I'd like to call to order the November 3rd, 2009 meeting of the Milton School Committee. Please join me in saluting the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a large crowd here this evening, and I want to welcome everyone. But um, before we begin our official meeting, I just um, ask that you indulge me for a moment. Since our last school committee meeting, the town of Milton has lost a giant of a man. Charles Winchester has been giving of his time and talents in the town of Milton, but most especially the schools, for approximately 30 years. He was the past chair of this school committee and most recently gave tirelessly of his time and talents to the school building project. For 11 years, Charlie attended over 300 public meetings, um, but hundreds more hours in order to meticulously oversee the school building project. He oversaw the construction and renovation of all six of our school buildings. How appropriate that our Milton High School Auditorium is named in his honor. For those of us who were lucky enough to work with Charlie, he will always be remembered for his gentle, calm manner, his attention to detail, and his dedication to the Milton Public Schools. He led by example and set the bar high for all who followed. Charlie is already sorely missed. Our thoughts go out to the Winchester family at this most difficult time and please join me in a moment of silence to honor the life of Mr. Charles Winchester. Thank you. I do want to note that the afternoon um, performance of The Music Man, which we'll be, um, we'll be hearing about in a minute, will be dedicated um, in the honor of Charlie Winchester. Thank you. Uh, so we need to approve this agenda. I'll, I'll accept a motion. Are there any corrections or changes to this agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. We're going to begin this evening with a really special treat. We have um, some of our performers from Music Man who are here today to entertain us. I'll invite you to come forward as I introduce you, please. We have Liana Genitis, who plays Marianne Peru. We have Lauren Stafford, who is Mrs. Mm -hmm. Peru. And we have Nick Marinelli, who is Winthrop <coughs> Peru. And Nick will sing Gary and Deanna. So and in welcome. The back, welcome. 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 Accompanying them is Dr. Noreen Burdett. And um, she's in the back. You can't quite see her, but you'll be enjoy company. her. So thank you. Welcome. So this is just uh, today, if I might, uh, the group traveled from, uh, the troop traveled from elementary school to elementary school with a little snippet of uh, the upcoming production of The Music Man and tonight for the audience, the school committee and the viewing public so that they will know on Friday, November 13th at 7 o'clock in the Charles w C. Winchester Auditorium or Saturday afternoon, if you can't go Friday night, at 2 o'clock, or Saturday evening at 7 o'clock, three presentations of The Music Man. Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, let me say it once again. Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, that's the town that knew me when. If you'd like to have a logical explanation How I happened on this elegant syncopation I will say without a moment of hesitation There is just one place that could light my face Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana Not Louisiana, Paris, France, New York, or Rome But Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana Gary, Indiana, my home sweet home. If you'd like to have a logical explanation, how I happened on the Felgins and Capacians, I will. 
will say without a moment of hesitation. There is just one place that can light my face. Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. Not Louisiana, Paris, France, New York, or Rome. But Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. My home, sweet home. forward to seeing you. Not this weekend, but next weekend. Milton High. Thank you. Uh, and now we're moving on to Citizen Speak. Um, first up is Erica Donahue, please. Thanks, Mary. Hey, Erica. Even the place doesn't matter. You can sit here. Just grab the microphone, please. Nope. It's okay. okay. Hi, uh, Erica Donahue, 117 Reed Stone Road. I come before you tonight to speak about the Latin program while it's still early in the budget process. More than once over the last several years, the Latin program has been threatened, and that is a travesty. Latin in the Milton Public Schools is more than a language. The children that choose Latin in the middle school learn Roman history, grammar, mythology, derivatives, mottos, and much, much more. At the high school, the learning continues with intensive grammar and translations of some of the greatest works in literary history. Latin is life-changing for some children. For these children, Latin extends beyond the school day to Latin club activities like catapult contests, celebration of Saturnalia, a holiday commemorating the dedication of the temple to the Roman god Saturn, and Kirtaman, a Jeopardy-like trivia game with buzzers and competitions against schools in the Boston area and beyond. Each year, dozens of children participate in graphic arts, fine arts, talent, Olympic, Kirtaman, and academic competitions, and yes, a toga parade, at the Massachusetts Junior Classical League Convention held each spring. A dedicated few even attend the National JCL Convention for a week each summer. The Latin Club is the largest club at the high school. There are many studies that demonstrate that children who study Latin perform better on the verbal SATs than children that study any other language. Although our beloved Cheers Latin teacher, Tamara Bauer, chose to leave our system due to the recurrent threat to the Latin program, we dodged a bullet by hiring a fantastic, energetic, and talented new Latin teacher, Rachel Curley. 66th graders have embarked on a life-changing journey with Ms. Curley. I would like to ensure that this journey continues. Please don't identify Latin as an enrichment activity, but recognize it for what it is, an integral and necessary part of the curriculum for a significant portion of the student body. Thank you. Thank you. Marian Sullivan is here to speak to us about an exciting program. Um, do you want to sit on that side? That would be fine. Yeah. Use the microphone, Bring the chair please. Up to the mic. Yes, thank you. Good evening. My name is Marian Sullivan. I live at 128 Gulliver Street, and I'm the director of the Council on Aging in Milton. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to come before the school committee tonight to let you know about some wonderful things that are happening at Tucker School. For those of you who don't know, the Council on Aging and Tucker have been best buddies for the last 15 years. We started with the Pen Pal program, and this is the 15th year. Our third grade English class um, meets with seniors, writes them letters throughout the year. This year, Miss Detterman, I'm sorry, Miss, she just got married, but I can't think of her married name. Detterman to us. <laughs> She's fabulous. And already we have 19 third grade is writing to seniors. They write all during the year. At the end of the year, we pay for a bus, bring them up for a pizza party, and it's just a fabulous program. And we know how stretched the teachers are. And for her to take this on, it's just been incredible. The letters that students write are just fabulous. One of our seniors, Elva Proctor, has continued to write to her pen pal, who was a senior in college. So it's a oh, fabulous program. Wow. Then this year we decided it was about time for the Council on Aging to honor the veterans in Milton. We thought we'd start with the veterans over the age of 60, and lo and behold, there were over 1,300 of them. Oh. <laughs> so we went to the age of 80, and on November 13th, we have, hopefully, 101 veterans coming to a very special luncheon, just to say thank you for all they do. In trying to put a program together, you know, you try and come up with, we're going to have entertainment, a speaker, but what would be great for the veterans. So 
in talking with Ms. Gormley, I asked her if maybe we could um, get some fifth graders to write letters or poems or thank you to the veterans. So of course I said to Mary, I would love to do it with my Tucker students. And um, I worked with Ms. Nguyen, who is absolutely fantastic, who said, come up, talk to the students, tell them all about it, we'll talk about it in class. And so here I have a booklet of 47 of the most, it literally brought tears to our eyes when we read these poems. The students put their heart and soul into them. And when I talked to them, I thought, they're not going to know a lot about veterans. So I tried to, you know, tell them. These students knew so much, and these will be given to everybody who comes to the luncheon. So I just wanted to let you know the fabulous work not only the students are doing, you know, and Miss Nguyen, again, stretched to the limit. And when we asked, there wasn't one hesitation, of course we'll do it. And if you don't mind, and I know you're pressed for time, could I just share two, not whole poems, just sentences? Please do. <laughs> this is by Anil Galloway. He writes, Although all the branches protect our ideals and keep us safe, I really admire the people in the elite force because they are given the most difficult and risky job. I am very proud and thankful of all the people in the Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, and the Navy SEALs for sacrificing themselves so we and the ones we love can be happy and enjoy the freedom that we have today. And just one other one. Kiara Martinez wrote, Without you, who will keep us independent and safe? What you have done means a lot to us. Your service, dedication, and commitment will always be remembered. We admire your courage and sacrifice. And they actually, they're all in color and they drew pictures. And um, of course, in the town we don't have a lot of money, so no one has a color copy. So we called Curry College, our friend Ken Quigley, and said, any chance if we supply the paper? So he copied 75 of these for us. So I'd like to leave this one with the school committee for you to look at. Um, and just one other brief comment. I guess I'm one of these people who don't have a lot to do because I watch you guys every <laughs> single <laughs> week. <laughs> and then I can relate to the seniors when they say, you know what, I couldn't hear that school committee, so I can tell them. And um, Linda Lee, I, last week I heard you give your review of Ms. Gormley, and I would just like to say as a department head of the town, I have never worked with anybody who has been so giving. You say, I need it, and it's there. Tomorrow I'm going to um, speak to the ninth grade about a community service program, trying to get some snow shovelers. And I just think that the lines of communication with Mary leading the pack have been incredible, and we so treasure the relationship the seniors have with the school teachers, administration, and students. So thank you very much, and I'll leave this with you. Thank, thank you so thank much. You we do feel the same way. <laughs> Susan Young, please. Can you just give your name and address? Okay, sure. Susan Young, 74 Washington Street, East Milton. First time at Citizen Speak. Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, we felt like we needed some new voices, some fresh voices. Um, I wanted to talk to people tonight about the importance of reading specialists in the classroom and the great loss that we feel like um, it's been since we haven't had that. My daughter Shannon is a second grader at Collicott. She's in the French immersion. Um, and we're just, uh, a lot of the parents were concerned because as the class sizes have gotten bigger, and mainly that's because this program had been so successful, we're losing those important resources. Um, when I read the newspapers and I see the trends with the MCAS scores, she's in second grade and will have third grade next year, of course I start to wonder and want to have her prepared. Um, and it's just that really the lack of resources at this level now is just making us question, are the kids truly going to be ready when it comes to next year? Um, I'm a middle school teacher in Boston. And so i um, used to following, you know, the adequate yearly progress and what needs to happen to help bridge that achievement gap. But the reality is, is if we don't provide the resources at these younger grades, we really do pay at the middle school level. When I look at what we've been doing in Boston, we're spending all this money on reading recovery programs, and it's because the kids aren't getting their services at that elementary level. And I just worry that um, if we don't put those reading specialists back in the classroom, what's going to happen to the kids who aren't able to access the science or the math, not because they're not interested or have the talents, but they're just struggling with that reading. So 
i just wanted to be a new face to come up here tonight and voice those concerns and say that you know for future budgetary considerations and there's any more stimulus money it's something that we're really you know concerned about and would appreciate for you to consider for the future thank you thanks for coming Mary Ann Rell is next please hello hi my name is Mary Ann Rell and I live at 58 Buckingham Road I'm here also to speak about reading specialists for the elementary schools I'd like to thank very much all the members of the school committee and the administration of the Milton Public Schools we're very very lucky in this town to have such committed individuals working in support of our school system I'm here tonight to request the hiring of reading specialists to assist in the elementary grades primarily the first second and third grades my daughter Anna is in Madame Olkin's second grade class at Cunningham School where there are 25 students there are many other classes of this size and larger across our school system I really feel strongly that large class sizes will have a ne negative impact on learning in our schools strong reading skills create a solid foundation for an e excellent academic career it is important that all students in Milton have the opportunity to receive first-rate reading instruction our town is faced with very challenging financial issues this year I am aware of the school committee and the school I am aware of the efforts by the school committee and the school administration to work with decreased budgets while student enrollment has increased the school's budgets have decreased during the past three years while student enrollment has increased by over 150 people the students to estimate this would be like the addition of six new classes of 25 students well funding has been reduced substantially it is really wonderful what your efforts have been able to do for the students of our school many people parents included do not realize the facts of the school's finances however I am asking you to again please reprioritize the resources please address the critical need of building strong readers in our schools it is essential to our elementary students who will eventually be our middle school students who will eventually be our high school students to have a strong foundation in reading thank you Thanks, Mary. Is there anyone else who came in late that would like to speak for citizen speak okay so we'll move on to um, our school committee minutes of October 6th I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes so moved oops second, second. Okay. <laughs> uh, any discussion all in favor it's unanimous thank you um, and we'll move on to the superintendent's report, Ms. Gormley. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sheridan. I'd like to ask Ms. Sheridan to join me this evening, and I would ask to join us at the table uh, with their parents, Jacqueline James, Charlie Rosemarin, John Shields, Samuel Shepard, and Graham Strange. Would you join us at the table with your parents? This is uh, again. This is uh, excuse me. This is a very very exciting night here in the Milton Public Schools. First to hear our students from elementary to high school giving you a uh, snippet from the Music Man. And tonight it's my distinct honor to recognize the students in front of you for their academic accomplishments. And first I'd like to recognize Jacqueline James. Jacqueline, would you stand up? Uh, Jacqueline is here this evening she's been recognized for the National Achievement Scholarship Program uh, the National uh, Achievement Scholarship Program uh, she has been recognized in the top 3% of all of the students in America who took the 2008 S, um, PSAT the award recipients are referred to over 1500 US colleges and universities mm -hmm. across the country top universities and only juniors were eligible 
uh, for this recognition. So on behalf of the Milton Public Schools, your peers, your teachers, your superintendent, your school committee, congratulations. <laughs> my pleasure uh, to award the National Merit Scholarship Program Letter of Commendation. The students who are commended tonight across the country are in the top 5% of more than 1.5 million students who took the 2008 PSATs. These commended students represent some of the most academically talented students in the country. You are commended um, on an index which will be explained to you in a letter that your principal, Dr. Drotter, is going to send to you. And it's with great pleasure that we rec uh, recognize and commend, we're very proud of Samuel Shepard. Samuel? He's not here this evening. We'll find him tomorrow. John Shields. John, congratulations. Indulge me for one moment. Um, the organization writes, the degree of success that these uh, students have achieved in the future will depend upon you, your time and abilities, and your perseverance towards the goals you set for yourself. We offer, the National Merit Scholarship Corporation says, they offer their best wishes in the hope that being commended, a commended student in the National Merit Program will broaden your horizons, encourage you to develop your potential to the fullest, and I don't have a hesitation that will happen. <laughs> Congratulations to you. Next, joining us at the table, uh, representing the Milton Foundation for Education, may we ask Denise Queerly, Margaret Eberhardt, Erica Donahue, Yoshi Balash, and Lisa Ras Viola to join us at the table. We have encouraged uh, representatives from the celebration uh, to attend our school committee meetings, they work tirelessly behind the scenes, uh, weekly meetings in preparation for um, all of the events that enrich the Milton Public Schools. So they're all here tonight, and um, I'm very, very proud to welcome you here this evening, and thank you. You have a microphone right there. Hello, my name is Lisa Viola. I live at 25 Collimore Street. I'm a proud Collie Cop mom. And um, together with Yashi Balash, I've had the pleasure of chairing the Monster Dash. And it is a, we held the event on October 25th, and we just wanted to share a bit of the good news about how the day went with you. Um, we were fortunate enough to have a, a beautiful day. Um, as you can see, Barbara Plonsky comes out every year and um, entertains us and the kids. Um, Tony Cicchello was on hand and spoke as well. As you probably know, the race is held in memory of Tony's son, Sam, um, who died very sadly um, 10 years ago. And the funds that are raised from the Monster Dash go to benefit elementary science. So the proceeds that we have, we work together with Barbara Plonsky to, um, to um, come up with programs that will have an impact on kids in the elementary schools. Um, so just a few fun pictures to share with you. Um, but the quick highlights from the race are that we had um, great turnout, um, 280 runners of the 5K, and for the kids' activities, 144, which is a record for us. Um, we took in over $12,000 gross, so we will have to reduce that for some expenses. Um, but we're hopeful that we continue many, we can continue many of the programs um, that we've had in place over the years for the elementary kids. The partnering with the Trailside Museum bringing in specialists from the Trailside Museum into the schools, um, sending kids on field, on field trips over to the Trailside Museum. We hope that we can continue all of that. Um, so just a few things that were new this year. Um, we partnered with Parks and Recreation. Um, Dave Perdios and Paul DeMano were great partners with us to help us coordinate the kids' activities. Um, that's something that we haven't done in the past. 
um, we had a competition to come up with a new t-shirt design. We had over 40 kids submit entries and some of, um, I know the viewers at home can't see this, but on the blackboards in front of you are um, all of the entries and the winning design is up on the, um, on the screen on the left. Um, it was submitted by a nine-year-old, Max Migel from Cunningham School. He did a great job and, um, and we used his drawing and um, this seemed to be a really fun way to involve the kids and get them excited about the race, so we hope to continue that next year. Um, we tried online registration and um, just a few of the activities we had were face painting, pup pumpkin decorating, uh, <coughs> making slime with Barbara. Um, it really was a fun day. <laughs> So, uh, of course, this wouldn't be possible without the help of um, many generous sponsors in the community. Um, so I feel like I should give them a brief plug, but, um, but I would be happy to entertain any questions. And I'm sorry, Yashi, I've done a lot of talking. Um, but it really was a great day, and we look forward to doing it again next year. Great. Thank you. It was a huge success. It was just so much fun to be there and see the faces of the kids and the adults alike and people that dressed up in costumes. and all for such a good cause. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I would also like to extend the thanks of the school system. And so many times during the school year, uh, the partnering field trips between grades three and five to the trailside activities in every elementary grade are all made possible through uh, the Monster Dash and Sam's Fund. So thank you. Okay. I just want to make sure you get the microphone. Oh, okay. Thank you. You want us to come over there? Sure. Thank you for having us. Um, we're also from the Foundation for Education, and we're co-chairing this year's um, Celebration for Education. I'm and Margaret Eberhardt. Uh, Erica Donahue. And Denise Quill, and we represent the elementary, middle, and high schools, That's which right. is really neat. We I never, represent all three. I just thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this year we have our 11th annual Celebration for Education and we're here just to give you a few highlights um, of that. Um, enrichment is the theme and I'm going to have Margaret talk about enrichment. Yes, we, do I have to talk into the microphone? we decided this year that we would use the money raised to promote enrichment programs across all six schools in town. Enrichment during the day, uh, so programs perhaps with art, with music, um, with um, drama, with theater. We haven't come up completely with what we're going to do yet, but we had a wonderful meeting at the end of the school year last year with all the department heads and with all the principals, and we have some really great ideas in mind. So enrichment is the theme this year, and I think it's going to be a really wonderful event. And when we raise lots of money, we'll be able to do lots of great things. So, so the details, obviously, it's November yep, 21st. Yeah, we're on the 21st at 6 p.m. at Lombardo's. You can purchase your tickets online at MiltonFoundationForEducation.org. Um, $75 each ticket and then $50 for staff and teachers. If you can't make the event, you can always make a donation as well. If you're one of the first people to, 100 people to purchase your ticket, you will get a free casino raffle ticket along with your entrance that you can put in one of the casino raffle bowls that we'll have at the event. And there's some really terrific uh, auction items, silent and live. It's just going to be a great event. There's something for everyone at this event. So I just wanted Erica to explain the casino. So um, we, we started last year with having a casino night, and it was so successful. People had so much fun that we decided to continue that into this year. There's going to be blackjack, um, over and under, or craps. We haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, there will um, be poker and probably a poker tournament again, um, roulette, and a money wheel. Um, quite a few live auction items, and we just um, listed a few here. Jim Wells, who is Chief um, Wells' brother, is going to be the auctioneer. Um, he's worked with a lot of charities around um, the state, including Father Bill's Place, Dana Farber, and um, St. Agatha's, and some other uh, local charities. And thanks to Mary Ann Rall, he was introduced to us. I don't know if she's still here. Um, but we have a week in the French Riviera, Riviera thanks to the Panarellos. Um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, thanks to the Mickle McIntosh family. Um, we have um, Tanya Nyack from HGTV, who is a resident in town, has offered her services. She'll color, uh, consult with you to color up to four rooms in your home, which is kind of a neat um, prize. 
we have some items for the dropkick murphys again this year we have um, two tickets and backstage passes to their um, 17th uh, march 17th st patrick's day show and we also have um, is there a dropkick murphys in fan in the house here somewhere can, can help me much. grab that picture oh yeah sure. thank you so much um the Dropkicks, um, I don't know if you've heard the Shipping Up to Boston song, but it's played <laughs> at a lot of the um, uh, sports um, events in town. I don't know where the camera is, but... Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so the Dropkick Murphys, um, that record went gold, but they don't have gold records anymore because it's all download. So this is the commemoration of that um, a gold record. This is a gold record right here. And um, Kenny Casey from the Dropkicks is a... Um, he used to live in Milton. He went to the Milton and went to Milton High School, and he has um, donated this to the Foundation for Education. Only about 15 to 20 have been made. One for each of the band members, one for their parents, and uh, a couple for close family and friends. And he's donated one to a charity, and that one is going to the Milton Foundation for Education. That's, so that's kind of neat. Um, there's a tour of Washington D.C. that um, Senator Lynch has donated. Um, a cocktail party for 25, um, Judy White and company, including Superintendent Gormley and John Phelan and, and Linda company. Lee. Yeah. <laughs> Will a company. <laughs> um, hopefully we'll have, <laughs> we'll have a whole bunch of um, sports stuff, um, as I, hopefully a lot of autographed things that will be attractive to people. And uh, we also have an idea coming from a Cunningham parent who saw a show on the Today Show a couple of months ago, weeks ago, um, a band in Harmony, Minnesota, I, I, a marching, marching band. band, actually, um, they um, used the band to help wake up or surprise some, a neighbor or a friend <laughs> in the town. Um, and people paid for that band to do that at <laughs> 7 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday or Sunday. So we, um, we asked the band leader, Eric actually asked the band leader, Mr. Good, yeah, is it? Um, if he would, you know, be receptive to that. And he said, oh, I'd love that, but I have a feeling that the Milton neighbors might not like that. So we, <laughs> we actually took it upon ourselves to call Chief Wells to ask his permission. <laughs> and uh, he, when I called him, um, he thought I actually was talking about the Dropkick Murphys. And he said, oh, yeah, no problem. He said, I'll just send a car up there. But um, he's fine with it. So um, we're really excited about that. We also have a bunch of silent um, auction items, over 70 thus far. And we hope to be able to post those. Um, on the web in drafts so people can see them. And uh, if you are out there and you have any item at all, um, any, no donation is too small, even a $10 gift certificate to Dunkin' Donuts or, you know, um, no donation in terms of an in-kind or cash is too small, so please consider that. I've talked. Enough. All right, we have comedian Paul Nardizzi, is that Nardizzi, you say? Yeah. Nardizzi coming to entertain everyone right before the live auction and a fabulous video presentation being put together by Tom Fahey. Um, then uh, that many parents and some teachers have been involved with and and the superintendent as well and there's a picture of the fabulous Tanya from HGTV <laughs> uh, one of the um, live auction items and of course bingo goes back by popular demand with Mr. Phelan as the bingo caller <laughs> thank you Mr. Phelan <laughs> and we're and we're also going to be selling Boston Tribune cruise raffle um, tickets starting uh, next week or I think it is right or next week and we'll be having them at pantry to conferences you can buy one ticket for twenty dollars or six for a hundred and it's to win a fabulous cruise for two on a Boston to Bermuda cruise so and there you go there's our lovely poster designed by Jen Healy thank you Jen if yes. you're at home watching she yes she spent a lot of hours working on that and that will be posted in each of the six elementary um, I'm sorry each of the six Milton public schools to advertise the event um, as w it will also be featured in the Milton Times this week. Um, but those are pictures of the French Riviera, a sleigh ride in uh, Jackson Hole, and this is the Buccaneer uh, St. Croix trip that the Rosners um, uh, donated again this year, and we may be using that for a raffle prize for the casino. These are all the wonderful volunteers. I'm not going to go through them, but this is, the, this is uh, the team of people that are behind us. Yeah, they deserve a big round of applause. And it's not too late to get involved if you want to help out. We, we have a lot of fun, um, and we really need you. So please let us know if you're interested in helping us out. Uh, there's a volunteer meeting on November 10th here in the library, and there's dealer training. If you're interested in being a dealer, we really need you. Lisa is, oh, she's a star dealer. It is fun, isn't it? It's great. And that training's on November 17th, and that's in the cafeteria here at the high school. 
And all hands on deck, using the Boston to Bermuda cruise analogy, um, for Saturday and Sunday. If you're available at all, I know you want to get your hair done and get ready for the event, which is great. But if you can help us set up, um, that would be great. And we'll have plenty of coffee for you on Sunday to help break down. So um, that's it. And this is how to reach us. MiltonCFE2009 at gmail.com is our email address. And please visit the web, uh, MiltonFoundationForEducation.org, to purchase tickets and um, donate online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before you go, I just want to say the other day I was up at the high school and I was looking in one of my kids' classrooms and I saw the graphing calculators that Milton Foundation bought. I saw the, uh, what do they call them, the big screens, the smart, boards. the smart boards, some of which Milton Foundation, the music stands. I didn't see a climbing wall because I was up at the high school, but everywhere you go in every of the six schools, you will see a ton of stuff that Milton Foundation money buys. So people might not realize that at home of how much you supply us with things that supplement our educational mission and that our educational status would look a little bit different without the help of Milton Foundation's money and funds. So thank you. And thank you for sharing it. Thank you. And um, just one quick quick um, response to that. Tom Fahey, that's one of the things he's going to be doing is developing a video that highlights those things by year, what the foundation purchased. And we're going to premiere, we're going to what do you call it? It's going to be premiered or whatever at right. the foundation at the celebration. But we are going to show that. Um, we're going to have a link on our web to that and also show it at all the open right. houses because I think it's important People for parents. Know. They don't know what a smart board does, right. and I think it's important for them to see it. So, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, ladies. So exciting. It's a great amount of time that they <coughs> give in order to make Tireless. this event happen, and not only them but their families at home that support it as well. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite to the table uh, the Cunningham Site Council, Principal Christine Gerber, Parent Drew Flanagan, Parent Jean Conley, and uh, Teacher Kathy Mulligan serves on the committee uh, but wasn't able to join us this evening. Good evening and welcome and thank you for your hard work. Uh, I believe it's going to take a minute uh, for this to get up. You received in your packet. Um, may I give these out? Yes, please. I'll, I'll give them. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for um, giving us this opportunity to come and speak with you all tonight about the work that the Cunningham School has been doing. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Drew Flanagan, who's one of our parent um, reps on the committee and Ms. Jean Connolly, who's another parent rep. We also have uh, Ms. Kathy Mulligan, who is a kindergarten teacher that represents the school, and Ms. Roberta Williams, who is a special education teacher who represents the school. We are in the process of um, uh, getting another parent volunteer because Marietta Surrett was on our team last year and her term has expired. So we're in the process of, of getting a new parent on board. Um, just a brief overview of the, uh, how the Cunningham did on the MCAS in 2009 and our AYP status. So in 2009, the Cunningham School met all of our AYP targets set by the state. Um, after being in AYP status for our subgroups in ELA in 2008, the Cunningham School is now listed as no status in both ELA and in math, which is, it, it sounds a little counterintuitive, but you want no status. <laughs> that is actually a very good thing. Um, and during the 2009-2010 school year, we're working to build on our improvements from the previous year. We know that we're in a good place, but there's always room to improve. So um, you have in front of you a very detailed outline of the Cunningham School Improvement Plan. And what I'm going to do on this PowerPoint is really just a general overview of some of the highlights um, one of the district's goals um, is to improve student achievement. And what I've done is I've listed some of the targeted, in targeted initiatives in both ELA and in math that we're implementing at the Cunningham School. So in ELA and in math, we have an open response initiative 
This began last year um, in January, and the teachers in kindergarten through fifth grade um, are doing open response type questions with the students um, during each month um, to help them understand the types of open-ended questions, and they're using it as a method of assessing student understanding. Um, in both ELA and in math, the Cunningham teachers are working to align all of their instruction to the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. Um, and what they do specifically is when they're planning their lessons, they're looking at the standards, figuring out what standards that particular lesson aligns to. Any work that is displayed, both in the classrooms and in the hallways, has a description of what was asked of the students, as well as the correlating math standards. Um, in English language arts, we are now expanding the Tufts Literacy Initiative from grades K through 2 all the way up to fifth grade, and that is beginning this year. Um, in both ELA and math, um, every classroom has word walls that um, highlight high-frequency words. Um, in ELA, the teachers are being trained in the use of benchmark assessments and are beginning to utilize them in all grades. And then, as well as in ELA and in math, uh, the teachers are we're working on differentiating classroom instruction to meet the needs of all learners, um, not just students that might be struggling, but students that are in the proficient and advanced categories, and how do we differentiate instruction for those students as well. Um, also in math, um, some, uh, one of the other things that we are going to look at doing this year um, is to initiate um, something that's called collaborative coaching and learning. Um, and we tried it last year um, for English language arts in our third through fifth grade, and we're going to do it this year in math. And what it is is essentially freeing up grade level teachers, um, bringing them together during the school day for about a half an hour to look at a problem of practice. Um, go into a classroom, watch a model lesson um, that addresses that problem of practice, and then come back out and debrief it. And the idea is that seeing it in action will have a greater impact on their own professional development in the field of math. Um, I'm going to be leading that um, with um, as many grades as possible. My goal is to do it for kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, and, and to begin that type of professional development with my teachers. Um, so those are the initiatives in a quick overview that you have in much more detail in the actual plan. The second goal um, that the superintendent has set is to increase teacher, parent, and community engagement. Um, one way that we're looking at um, increasing teacher engagement at the Cunningham School is I do weekly bulletins that outline initiatives that have come to me from the superintendent or that highlight initiatives that we are doing in the school so the teachers have an understanding and are up to date um, weekly with what, what is happening. Um, the big thing that we're doing this year is we are taking our faculty meetings. We have faculty meetings once a month and we're aligning those faculty meetings to the district goals um, that set common expectations expectations for student achievement. So the one thing that the Cunningham School is doing with the teachers during the faculty meetings this year is we're looking at ways to incorporate the open response questions as a form of assessment um, that's common across grade levels. Um, so kindergarten teachers are working collaboratively to develop open-ended uh, questions that they can implement with their students and then come together and assess them and figure out from the assessment the particular needs of individual students and how their instruction can change based on the assessment. Um, we are also doing grade level or grade span meetings to discuss student data. Um, we started with our first professional development day back in August. Um, and all of the teachers came together and we were able to go over the MCAS scores in depth with the teachers at that point. Um, and then periodically through the year, I will um, take grade level teachers, meet with them, and do some in-depth analysis of their grade specific data. 
And then in terms of parent and community engagement, um, I do weekly parent bulletins as well that try to keep the parents informed and involved in the school community that's happening on a weekly basis, upcoming events that are going on. Um, we, this is new. We're, it had been done prior to me coming um, to the Cunningham and we're um, bringing it back this year, monthly Cunningham newsletters. I have a team of parents that I'm working with. Um, and the aim of the, uh, the newsletter really is to go in depth into the instruction and in the life of the Cunningham School, um, whether it's through pictures, student work, interviewing teachers, um, websites that are helpful for parents um, to work with their students at home on homework, um, and a monthly message from me that targets specific curriculum areas. We are doing as we have in the past PTO meetings. The way we're doing it this year is the PTO meetings are every other month and on the off months I'm doing um, what we're calling curriculum nights. Um, last week we had our first which was really going in depth into looking at the Cunningham MCAS and AYP data. Um, the one that we're doing in September is a math curriculum night. Uh, December. December, thank you. Um, the one we're doing in December is a math curriculum night. We'll also do literacy and we'll also do science and technology as well. So I'd like to just leave with some wonderful pictures of our students in action this year. These are actual current pictures of the kids in action in various grade levels um, all the way from kindergarten up I th think the highest it goes is fourth grade right there. So if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Would you like us on that side? I yeah. think so. That would be great. That was a quick response. <laughs> and take the microphone if you don't mind. Thank you. Maybe pull up. I have a couple questions. Uh, well, actually, one. The first one is um, in regards to the benchmark assessments mm -hmm. that you're using. Are those homegrown, or are you using? Fountas and Pinnell. Okay. Yes. Um, over the summer, um, our consultants from Tufts University came in and did some training with the teachers. It was all voluntary. Um, I have to say, um, out of the Cunningham staff, we probably had three quarters of our staff that were there. Um, and have been inquiring um, on a daily basis when the follow-up is going to be. And we actually, it's taken root to such a great degree that we can't actually keep track of where they are. So we have a sign-in and out sheet um, to make sure we know where all the assessments are. Follow-up on that, um, there's been the development of a book room. I don't know if you've been able to see it. Where, where are the leveled sets of books are all in one place. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks to the Milton Foundation for Education. Yes, and um, it's so clear, clearly it goes from A to Z. So when they do do these assessments, there's a reason for it. Then they can go in and get leveled sets of books at the student's level. It's, it's really nice. If you get a chance to go see it, it's right on the first floor. So leveled books, just so everyone knows, tell you what the instructional level of the child is. And um, once you do the assessment, then you can put the child in the appropriate book that is good for their reading level. Mrs. Kelly. And so can you just describe for parents at home who may not be aware of, of this, so, so what does that look like for an individual child? You want to take it? Sure. Um, the assessment is an individual test one-on-one -on -one, and in the end the teacher grades the test and the assessment tells what level, which is A to Z, that the student is at. And each grade level really has guidelines or you know, benchmarks that you want to reach. Now, if you have a, a class from E to L, you can't do the same book with all of the children because it's too easy for some, it's not challenging for them, and it's too challenging for others. What you can do is go in somewhere like the book room and find different, different books at each student's level. Usually you have a group of students at each one of those letters. And with the book room, we've been able to kind of get curriculum sets you know, let's say you're doing the American Revolution, you may have three different sets of books of the American Revolution at three different levels. So they're learning the same content, 
but it's at their reading level. And the test, the assessment, is what, what gets you to the right level. And so um, would a teacher be doing an assessment for the entire class at the same time, or is this sort of an evolving process? The benchmark assessments are done individually, and the teachers are doing it as well as some of our special education teachers are helping, because it, it does take quite a bit of time to do an individual assessment on Excuse me one students. second. You're holding the um, button. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're shutting yourself off. <laughs> um, so that takes a while. Once they have that data, um, it can look differently in the classrooms, but the idea is that the teacher would start with um, a strategy instruction with the whole class. And then based on the individual levels um, and the needs of, of children, take guided groups. And with those guided groups, you can have anywhere from you know three to six children. You have the books that correlate to their reading level that you've gotten from the book room. Um, you work with those children. Then the other children are given a task um, that they're working independently on. They're reading independently in a book that is also matched to their particular level. Um, so today I observed a lesson in which a teacher was doing um, connections, making connections. And the children all had books that were on their appropriate reading level. And they were working to make connections between the book and their personal lives to help them understand how the characters were feeling. Um, and, and so would this be described as differentiated instruction? Yes. I, and I guess I just want to bring, I mean, for people who grew up, mm -hmm. when I grew up, everyone was given the same book mm -hmm. and we were all expected to follow along. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'd like to understand from the perspective of the teacher's time, what does this involve depending on how many students and how many different levels of, of um, you know, sort of where people are at in their classroom does this take? And you know how do, how do we meld it all together? Because this is a diff certainly a different way than when I was taught. Um, it does take time. I think the assessments are the piece that take the largest amount of time. Um, in terms of working with kids, to you teach them how to choose books that are just right for them, and there are methods and strategies that they teach the children so that when the kids go off and they're selecting books that are appropriate for them they have strategies in which they know then, okay, this book is not appropriate for me, it's too hard, or it's just right, or it's too easy. And so they're learning independence when they're selecting text. Um, they're planning the whole class lesson, just the same as they would plan for, you know, when we were all growing up and using the same text. Um, and then from the data that they've collected from the assessments and from conferences that they have individually when children are reading independently, they can then pull a group and they would plan for that group as well. Um, it is time consuming. It, it takes time, but I think it's a, a purposeful approach to teaching that allows them to really know individual learners. Um, and Ms. Gerber, will you share the training that happens on the professional development days leading into this? So we've had uh, training from Tufts University come in, and they've worked um, for the last two years with kindergarten through second grade. Um, they come in for our professional development days, and they do um, instruction basically in what Reader's Workshop looks like, um, and they go through some in-depth planning with the teachers during those times. We also then have three half days a year where they come in and they work with essentially the collaborative coaching and learning model that I was talking about that we do with math. They come in, they meet with the teachers on a grade level, um, they discuss a problem of practice or an issue that they may be having in their classroom. Um, last year we worked on how do you do an interactive read aloud um, that really sparks the children's thinking. So they talked about it, they read articles on it, then they would go in and the consultant from Tufts actually modeled a lesson in one of their classrooms with the children. Um, and then they came back and they debriefed and they discussed then how they would follow up with that. Ms. Debbie Jones? So is the goal to have this done on every child in grades one and two? Is that what I heard you say? Or grades one the through assessment? five? The assessment. The uh, assessment. The goal is eventually to have these assessments for K through five. Okay, K yes. through five, and, and at the beginning of the school year, I assume? What we'd like to do is to have it at the beginning of the school year, at the middle, and then at the end. 
Um, and how are you finding the teachers are getting the time to do that? I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, it's fabulous. Yeah. But how are the teachers having the resources to do this? We actually have, I have to say, that our, um, our special education teachers have stepped in and they've really done s a great deal of the assessment. So I know that in a first grade class, what they've done is the teacher has done um, a third, the special education teacher has done two thirds um, because she has a little bit more time and they'll pull kids aside. Um, the other thing that I've seen done is teachers while the kids are working independently, they can pull a child into the back of the room and do it at that point. Um, the feedback that I've gotten from the teachers is that yes, it does take time, but the information that they mm -hmm. get is so incredibly valuable for their instruction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that taking the time, you know, the first month of school is, is incredibly important to them. That's amazing. Thank you. Mrs. Kelly. And, and so the library is available through what grades at, at present? For the book room, or the or well, sort of the whole assessment package you were just referring to. We have K through five. It, it's available K through five. We're getting extra sort of professional development concentrating in K through two. Is that K through five? Oh, that K through five. five. It is K this through year. five. Okay. That's expanded this year, so everything the intermediate. Has been expanded. Um, we started with K through two with mm -hmm. the professional development. Um, thanks to the Milton Foundation for Education. Thank you all very much <laughs> because. Without them, we would not have had the book rooms that we have. Um, so the book room really has leveled readers from A through Z. So it really covers mm -hmm. every grade. Um, mm -hmm. And now this year, we've expanded the professional development. Um, it's still going K through two, but it's expanded to third, fourth, and fifth grade. And just and it's one a two-year process. Um, so, so do we have French texts that are also part of this assessment? Yes, a Gracie Burke has actually worked once we've start once we started doing this. Gracie Burke has taken um, last year. She started working with her kindergarten first, first and second grade teachers, um, and has found similar assessments out of Canada that the teachers are using, as well as similar level text. Um, and the teachers, the French teachers, have also taken this on. And I know that um, before. I arrived, there were leveled French readers that had been purchased, I think, when the Milton Foundation um, did the French Immersion Program. So we do have texts in, in French as well as English. So just to um, clarify that, the assessment actually can be word reading, and then it's reading a passage, and then there's comprehension that's included in, that's what the assessment is. And I think it's important to note, Ms. Sheridan, uh, that this is a system-wide initiative. So uh, the leveled readers are in every one of the schools. All of the teachers participate in the professional development. Great. Mr. Pavlicek? Um, is this a subject of one of your curriculum nights with the parents as well? Yes. Because I was going to say, for a, a parent walking in who's, you know, piggybacking on what Mary said a while ago, walks into a classroom today, doesn't see anything they recognize as at least from their own memory, is that they look at it and say, "Why that classroom's terribly disorganized? They're all over the place and they're doing this." And it's just a completely different kind of organization, rather than being you know, disorganized. It is organized, but it's a like completely different paradigm. Yeah. And, and that was actually really when we met as um, you know the school site council. That was really one of the things that came out of our work was that we realized there were things that were happening both with MCAS as well as instruction mm -hmm. that many of the parents um, either didn't understand completely or didn't really know. Um, and so that was why we initiated the, the curriculum nights to help uh, the parents understand what the instruction is on a daily basis um, and how they can help prepare their children mm -hmm. at home. Great. So the informed instruction is really much more strategic than it has been in the past, and it helps the children achieve um, better, more quickly. Mrs. Kelly said differentiated. Own. Right, differentiated instruction. Um, one other question. So how are you using the benchmarks? Is there, is there a grade um, policy if you, if you don't reach a benchmark by the end that of a grade? That hasn't been completely established. We're going to work on that this year. Um, and actually, that speaks to the teacher time, too. Maybe if they reach the benchmark in January or February, if they're not tested in June, at least we know they've met the, the benchmark, you know, if the time runs out. <coughs> it's really the strugglers and those that are a little slower to reach the benchmark that you continue to keep testing and see the growth. 
you know, yeah. for someone that reaches it in January, if they're going to be tested again in September, you know, if you don't get to it in June, mm -hmm. you already know they've reached the bench bar. Great. Thank you. Mrs. Kelly? Sorry. Um, you've listed the open response in both math and English. Um, if you could speak to whether this uh, process is teaching to the test, which I think some people may think that it is, but I'd like to hear your comments on that. I think that um, the structure of open response is a type of question that is on the test. However,